Good morning. I'm Tim Mather. I'm joined by Dr. Vivek. Dr. Vivek, say good morning to everyone. Good morning, everyone. Nice to have you all here. It's uh, 6 a.m. on the West Coast, 9 a.m. on the East Coast. And uh, for those joining us around the world, uh, welcome. Thanks for staying up late or getting up early. And um, this is the very first session of two days of great content. And we're going to start out with the very basics, just the introduction to NetPoint. Uh, for those of you maybe who have never seen NetPoint before, this is going to take you from start to create a whole schedule in 50 minutes. So feel free to uh, chat in with some of your comments. We've got uh, moderators standing by for your questions, and we'll try to address them during this time. If we can address them during this time, we will follow up with you after the conference. Um, so let's get started. You're looking at a NetPoint screen. And the net point screen is showing you a time scale. And within that time scale, what we call is the canvas where you can actually add activities and uh, draw your schedule. So what's important to bear in mind when you're first starting to create a net point schedule is uh, in part, what page size do you wanna print out? And that's important because net point is exactly a mirror of what the printout will be. So if your printout is going to be bigger, then your page size for drawing your schedule will also be bigger and vice versa. If it's smaller, then your page size will be smaller. And that's important because you don't want to create a schedule in one size and then change the size for printing because that can create uh, some unpleasant side effects. So how do you do that? How do you say, I want my page to be eight and a half by 11 or uh, some other size. You go right down to print setup. And when you're in print setup, you can say which size you want for your printout. And you could also um, kind of a good practice is to switch from uh, any other local printer you have to an Adobe printer. And that way, if you send the schedule to someone else, they'll be able to replicate your printer. Um, NetPoint is dependent on which printer is selected in order to, to name the parameters for uh, print out and for the screen. So we're just going to leave this on letter size for Adobe. And another thing you can do is you can adjust your calendar right at the start. When you're first creating a schedule, it's good to know how long is my project going to be, basically about how long is it going to be, and then leave a month at the end and a, a month at the start, just a little extra planning room. So how do you do that? You go up to the schedules and you say modify schedule properties. And right here under the dates tab, you can say, okay, I want my time unit to be days. This is something you need to do right at the start of the schedule is determine which time unit you want to use. Um, you can do days, you can do all the way up to years. Um, we've had clients planning 20, 25 year programs. And obviously you can't really do that by the day. Um, so uh, we're going to stick with day for this one. Here you have your calendar start and end dates. And then also your project start and end dates. The thing to remember is your project start and end dates have to be uh, a little bit inside of your um, calendar start and end date. So your start date has to be a little bit later than the start of the calendar and your completion date has to be a little bit uh, earlier than the end of the calendar. Once that stuff's set, then you're ready to start planning. And the way you plan in that point is really quite simple. You just start drawing your schedule. So let's say that you have your first activity and this uh, bar up here represents uh, activities. And once that's selected, then you get this crosshair uh, out on your canvas. And the crosshair is gonna tell you what date you're starting on. Uh, and you can see that you get the day of the week, you get the date, and you also get a little color code. The color code tells you whether or not you are on a working day or a non-working day. If it's red, then you're on a non-working day and uh, you probably don't want to start your activity on that day. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started planning. Um, you can see over here, we've got our project start, but it looks like it's kind of fallen off the canvas a little bit. So I'm going to drag it over. That probably happened when we changed printers, um, just a little bit of adjustment on the way that laid out. And now I'm going to create my first activity. And I'm gonna create it starting on the 19th. And you just click and drag to the right to create an activity. 
So you can see the duration is spreading out. The dates are changing. I'm going to make this an 80 day activity. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, there we go. 80 days. And we'll call this um, permits. It's a good place to start in any project is get permits. Um, you can see now that this activity is spanning over this period of time. You can relatively see it via calendar up here. And then we're going to add a second activity. Um, we're going to call that one uh, clear site. There we go. Now we've got clear site and permits on the canvas. One thing that's a little bit unique about NetPoint is you can see that we have both activities on the same horizontal plane. And um, so that's a, that's a big benefit. You can add a lot more information and it also makes it uh, more obvious to end users who aren't schedulers uh, where the path is headed. So uh, you can grab clear site and move it around, put it anywhere you want. You'll notice that clear site is not having any impact on permits when it moves backwards. And that's because uh, they're not logically tied together yet. But if we were to select both of them, I'm going to do that just by drawing a little box around them like this. Select both of them and then use this linking tool to link them together. So now permits is the predecessor, clear sites is the successor, and they're going to start impacting each other. So right now there's a little gap in between these two, you can see. And that's important to understand that in that point, we let the planner pick where they want to put the activity. So uh, you can place it anywhere on the time scale. Uh, it doesn't slide to the early date, to the day to date, anything like that. It just sits where it sits until you change it or until some logic forces a change. So for instance, um, if this gap between permits and clear site were to go away because permits got delayed, let's delay permits for a little bit. We're gonna go one day at a time, delaying permits, 13, 14. You can see the project manager starting to break out in a sweat. Things are gonna get pushed. Okay, so now that we've run out of gap between those two, permits is going to start pushing clear site. And this is a interactive portion that point that's very important, especially when you're doing interactive planning sessions. Uh, people can actually see the impact of the choices that they're making as the network is uh, developing. So let's add another activity to this. Um, let's say we want to do um, foundation. Now we've got this third activity. It's not tied into the overall network yet. So again, if we grab that foundation activity and start moving it around, it doesn't impact anything else. It's just gonna sit there. Uh, but if we link it together with clear site, so let's draw a little box around those two, link them together. Now all of a sudden foundation can start impacting clear site, which will in turn start impacting permits. You can see there they're moving together. Now, we have some pretty basic information out here on the screen. We've got the start date, the finish date, and the, the duration. And we also have the descriptions for the activities. But there's a lot more information behind this. And you can also control some of the formatting. So let's take a look at that. Let's uh, select all of these by drawing a box around them. And then we're going to go up to objects and then set properties for selected objects. This is a box where you can make changes to multiple activities or objects at the same time. For instance, um, I don't like the way these dates are kind of bumping into each other, these start and finish dates. So I'm going to, in this chain, I'm going to turn off all the finish dates. And you do that by clicking on finish dates until it's an empty box. So this would mean they're all on. This would mean leave them alone, don't change them. And this means they're all off. And I'm also going to turn on a couple of uh, these properties here. I'm going to turn on drift and float and total float. And that's going to lead into a little discussion we will have about uh, drift float and total float and what those mean in net point. I can see here that I've, uh, I've done a little bit too much trimming. Looks like I've taken the end date off of foundation, which could be important on my canvas. So I'm going to go ahead 
directly into the foundation activity properties. And then I'm going to go into turn that back on, that display that date, that finish date. Now, uh, good question. Thank you. How do I how do I get that box to pop up? You just double click on the activity and the properties uh, box comes up and then you can go to each tab as needed. So let's have a discussion about um, the drift float and total float. And uh, this is part of the reason we have a PhD with us just in case I run into some problems with uh, doing the math on these. But um, drift is unique to NetPoint. It's, uh, it's the ability to calculate how far we can move to the left on the time scale earlier without impacting the start of the project. So we have two days of drift right here. Um, this is 116 and this is 119. So you can see there are two days because there's a non-working day in there. Uh, there's two days of drift. And then for float, we have 137 days. And that's calculated from all the activities linked together, any gap in between those activities, and then all the way to the end of the project uh, where that end project bar is. So uh, what's total float then? Well, those of you who are uh, puzzle solvers out there in the audience have probably already figured out that total float is drift plus float. So any change in either float or drift will cause total float to, to change values. And uh, one way to demonstrate that is to grab your project end. I'm going to highlight that and start to move that to the left. And you can see that my float calculation and my total float calculation are going down as I move the project completion to the left or closer to the end of foundation. So that's kind of the dynamic uh, way that NetPoint calculates on the fly. We, we have what we call a self-healing algorithm uh, that we're, we have a patent on where if uh, you were to push clear site forward one day, you can see that foundation moves along with it. And so you never end up in a situation where you have a negative uh, lag or uh, some logic that, that actually is illogical. So let's say that you wanted to highlight these first three activities and call that phase one. One way to do that in NetPoint is to select the activities and then come up here to hammock and create a hammock. So it says, where would you like your hammock? I'd like it on tile two. And there it is. And we'll call this uh, phase one. So now, anytime something changes in the elements of the hammock, the hammock itself will also change. And what would happen if project completion came all the way back here? Oh, looks like it went critical. In that point, when something goes critical, uh, what happens is it turns bright red. And so when you're working with a more complex uh, network, it's easy to follow the critical path. You just follow the red uh, line through the, through the network. And let's say, for instance, that um, someone who was less experienced at using NetPoint uh, had made this network, but they forgot to link together clear site and permits. If that's the case, guess what's going to happen when this comes over? We don't get critical. Why? Because we don't have a logical link here. So suddenly we have all this drift. And how am I calculating criticality in this network? Well, to find that out, you go up to schedule and then go back to schedule modify, modify schedule properties. And then look here where there's criticality factor. And I'm using total float, which is float plus drift as my criticality factor. And the criticality threshold is zero. So when I get zero on total float, then I get criticality. So I'm going to switch that now to just float. And when I do that, and come back here, suddenly these first two activities in the, or these last two activities in the chain become critical. This one does not because it still has so much float because it's not tied to clear site. So when you're working with a network, if things are not turning uh, critical where you think they should, 
One thing to do is check your float calculations and see if maybe you've missed a, a logical tie. And another thing to do is check up here under modify schedule properties and see how am I how am I calculating criticality and what is my threshold for criticality. Now, um, sometimes it's helpful to see how big a gap you have between two activities. And you can do that by double clicking on the link itself. And then you get the link properties. And within the link properties, you can say, I want to display my gap. And that's what we call the distance between uh, two linked activities uh, on their plan dates. We have a gap. And so what we do in that point, which is unique uh, in, in scheduling programs, is we don't do a forward pass and backward pass. What we do is we kind of start with the start of the project and move through the logical chain. Uh, and then as we encounter a gap, then we'll add that. We add the uh, durations and then we get the uh, total chain length. And that's how we calculate float and drift and how we uh, establish criticality in a, in a net point schedule. I'm gonna grab a little drink of coffee here on the West Coast, it's nice and early. And so, okay. Now, uh, let's take a look at what would happen if we wanted some different type of logical connection between activities. Let's say that we wanted a, a start to start. Uh, we have these, what we call embeds or embedded nodes, and these create a jumping off point within an activity so that you can do uh, alternative logic like start to start and finish to finish. So let's demonstrate that. We'll do a start to start uh, with an offset under clear site. And then I'm going to create an activity here and we'll call that fencing. Not the Olympic sport, um, the, the kind of fencing that protects you from people wandering onto your job site. Okay, so then I select that embed, I select the activity and link them together. So now that they're linked, Fencing can actually become a driver on this network. If you move fencing far enough back, it's going to start moving clear site. And if clear site moves far enough back, it's going to start moving permits. And we're going to get all the way back so that we have zero drift. And day one of the project is day one of permits. 80 days for permits. Sounds like we're going to have more than one uh, meeting of the uh, governing body before we get our permit but that's not all that unusual. Um, so you can see here, we've got, hey, Dr. Vivid, maybe you could help me figure this one out. How could it be that this chain is critical, but fencing isn't critical? Well, it has a ton of float. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Let's take a look at how much float it has. 54 days. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I just did that on the fly, so I'm glad that it worked out. Um, I was uh, a little concerned that maybe something was not. Oh, there it goes critical. If, you, if it loses all of its float, then it goes critical. All right, that's very helpful. So a few other things you might want to think about as you're creating a schedule. Um, you can have all kinds of different levels of detail on a net point schedule, all on the same canvas. So let's say for instance, that you wanted to have some more room up here for planning and you select these activities and push them down a little bit. And then we're gonna put in some milestones. So a milestone in that point, you can have a finish milestone or a start milestone. And they will basically track with the object that they're tied to. So let's create a finished milestone called N phase one. And I set that off to the right a little bit. And there's a good reason for that. If you try to link a milestone, a finished milestone before the finish of the activity, it's gonna tell you you're making a mistake and it won't do it. So um, having done that several thousand times in my life, I've now learned to set the milestone a little bit off to the right. Then I'm gonna link the end phase one to the end of foundation using our handy link tool. And you see how that snaps right to the end of uh, foundation. 
So now you have this kind of higher level of abstraction in the schedule. This, uh, you start with a milestone, then you move down to hammocks, and then you move down to the detail. And you can do all that on the same page, which is very helpful. And some people want to track across the top and see, okay, where are my key handoff points? What are the, what's important to pay attention to here? And within that, then you can track. Now, it might be a little more helpful if we could highlight the different sections, kind of like, I don't know, like a swim lane or something. So I'm going to move this down one more notch. And then I'm going to use this handy tool, uh, which we call shading. So you just click right on that shapes button there, and then you can draw a little box. And that box is going to be highlighting the section of the schedule. So now I'm going to say I want it to be horizontal, and I want it to not be a regular object, but rather a canvas object. That's helpful because if you leave it as a regular object, every time you try to grab something in the uh, box, you're likely to grab the box itself. And having done that several thousand times, I'm now uh, well aware that that's frustrating. So I don't do that anymore. So now we have this uh, nice kind of highlighting of that first section where the milestones are. And then I'm going to add a text to that to kind of explain what it is. So up here, I'm going to say uh, um, milestone section. And then that's going to pop into place. I might want that to be a little bigger, maybe like have it stick out a little bit. So if you double click on it, then you can control size and color and all that kind of thing. So there you are with your milestone section. Then you have your hammock section. And then down here, we have a detail section. Maybe we'll put in one more shade uh, and kind of highlight this detailed section. Oh, man, what did I do? This is terrible. Now the whole schedule is messed up. I've done something terrible. What can I do about it? Well, the great thing is that uh, in that point, we have this undo. You can undo anything pretty much in that point with a very few exceptions. And we always tell you what those are. So you never have to worry about making a big mistake in that point. You can always undo. And if you undo too many times, you can redo. So as you're working with that point, if something happens and you don't like the results, just go up here and click undo and it's like it never happened. It would be uh, so handy to have one of those in your life. Um, but unfortunately, this only works within that point. So now I'm going to put this uh, next shade here. Again, we're going to go horizontal on this and we're going to change it to canvas background. And there it is. Let's call this the detail section. So I'm going to go back to my text box. Yeah, maybe make that a little bit bigger too. You can see that uh, the text is fairly large on the activities and the objects I'm creating. And I did that on purpose so that as people are looking at this uh, schedule around the world, they can clearly read what's uh, what's being typed out. And I did that by setting their default for objects, for new objects. So up here, you can say, I said, I want that text size to be 15 for new activities, um, milestones, benchmarks. You can set preset all of those. You can also change the color of uh, the bars in that point. So for instance, if uh, let's say that you were going to self-perform on clear site and foundation, but you're going to have a vendor do fencing. You could double click on this and you could say, okay, all my vendors, um, now I got to find that section. Oh, there we go. Woo. Uh, all my vendors are going to be uh, blue, let's say. Um, so I'm going to take this uh, blue and apply it to that activity. Oh, thank you. So now fencing turns blue. Everybody in the interactive planning session knows this is an outside vendor. You're not self-performing. And um, that's very helpful. So we have now a schedule with three sections. We have uh, text boxes. We've got shade. We've got an end, ending milestone. We've got a hammock. We've really kind of created a nice little network here. But there's one thing I don't like, which is the project completion is kind of off here in the distance. We've got 35 days of float 
in our schedule. How could we create a, a little bit of a tighter schedule here? We created this uh, item called a benchmark. So we're gonna add a benchmark to this. And a benchmark is kind of, a, if you're a P6 aficionado, it's kind of like a, a doubly constrained milestone. So a benchmark doesn't move and it is terminal to float. So I'm gonna call this end phase one. And I'm going to select, oops, I didn't quite get my selector selected. There we go. Uh, foundation and select that benchmark and then link those two together. And now look what happened to my float. Now I'm down to five days of float because this is tying off to this finished benchmark and that's going to be the end of my float. This can be very helpful if you're looking to apportion float within phases of the project. If you build your network in such a way that each phase terminates into a, a benchmark, then your float will be uh, limited within that phase. So the first people in the project can't consume all the float for people later in the project. Um, they're gonna reach criticality sooner. Even if the total float for the project is larger, you can control that with this benchmark. So let's talk about some other uh, kind of fundamental basic items up here. Let's see what we've been through so far and, and what we have yet to speak about. Um, these buttons up here are all pretty basic. Uh, you know, I want to start a new project. I want to open an existing project. I want to save my current project. Matter of fact, um, it's a good time to save right now because um, one of the things that when you're doing an interactive planning session is it's hard to start over. So when I do an interactive planning session, I save on, on a regular basis to make sure that I have a version of the, of the plan in case my laptop crashes or something like that. Now you can see here, when I say I wanna save it, it's coming up and it's showing me a bunch of uh, folders and um, I'm just gonna save this one right here. I'm gonna call it a conference demo. And what that's gonna do is out in the system, it's gonna create a folder called conference demo and it's gonna put some files in that folder, including this, this XML file that we're creating here. And one of the basic rules of using that point is don't mess with those things on your own. Don't go down to your file folder control and start trying to play with those or move them around. Just use NetPoint, open them, close them, export them, do whatever you want, but do it through NetPoint. So now that we've saved that uh, file, you can see up here, now it's called conference demo and instead of net point one. And we can start to do, maybe we wanna add, um, maybe we wanna add, what do we wanna add Vivek? Uh, how about a start milestone? We'll put that up here. And we're gonna call that start phase one. Okay. And then we'll link, oops, I did that again. I'm not selecting my selector. Okay, there we go. Start phase one, we'll link that to the start of permits. And you can see here, I got a little problem. I've got my uh, milestone bumping into my project start. So I'm just gonna move that down a little bit. Something else you could do if you don't like where a description is, you can change it. In uh, milestones, you could say, okay, I want my description to be located to the right. And you can change the shape of it too. So let's change that to maybe a flag. So there we have the start of phase one. It's dated, it's hanging out there with the flag and it's linked directly to permits. So as permits move, so does that's nice. Now you can see everything is moving kind of together here. And uh, maybe Dr. Vivit could explain that behavior to us. Yes, yeah, so basically the idea over here is the self-healing that you referred to earlier. As you move permits, it's creating negative relationships or links with clear sight, which pushes clear sight forward. And that pushes foundation and fencing forward. So essentially keeps the whole 
uh, network in sync with any changes that you make at any point in time? So for instance, if uh, there were a gap between clear site and foundation and you start to move permits, you see foundation doesn't move because there's nothing to heal there at this point. But once we start impacting it, then it's gonna move with us. Very interesting. Okay, so uh, let's also talk about uh, different ways you can view the same schedule. So for instance, right now, I think we're just exactly at zooming level 100 and we're stretched a little bit. So let's explain zoom and stretch and how those work. Up here, you can grab this uh, bar and start dragging and that will stretch the schedule. You can also change the grid size and you can grab one of these little gray boxes on the side. And as you drag that down, it will stretch it out or you can scrunch it up. That's very helpful if you wanna get more information on a page, just shrink your grid size a little bit and you get a lot more real estate. Um, you can also zoom in and zoom out. So when we go back here, if you increase the zoom factor, then you're gonna make the plan a lot bigger to look at, but you'll be able to see less of the plan. You can also zoom way out if you have a big schedule and you wanna see the whole thing. Now, um, one of the great benefits that we have here in our development team is that we have hundreds of users inside PMA that use NetPoint. And we also have great customers that we've had for a long time. And they're never short on uh, suggestions um, for how we can improve the tool. One of the great suggestions we had um, came from our friends at Jacobs who uh, many of them are now with Whirly, but uh, they wanted a, the ability to split a screen. Um, so we're going to do a vertical split on this schedule. And what that's going to do is it's going to split the schedule and show the exact same schedule on two different screens. But you can see you actually have the ability to change the zoom and stretch on just one of the two screens. So what this does is when you're doing an interactive planning session, if you want to get it right into the details of something, you can get right into the details here. And as you move it, you'll see the impact on the overall schedule, even though you can't see the whole schedule on the right. And that can be very helpful. You can also split uh, vertically, uh, I'm sorry, horizontally. So let me do that. I'm gonna do a horizontal split. So now you have the same schedule on the top of the bottom. And if we were to change a zoom factor right to the, regular zoom factor on both. Okay, let's check this one. Yep, okay. So this can be helpful if you wanted to show uh, the impact of a change to the schedule and you wanted to highlight a certain section, you can do the vertical split and highlight that section. In uh, just a couple minutes, we're gonna start uh, having our moderators read us questions. Um, we're scheduled for the session to end at 10 to the hour. And so we wanna have plenty of time for questions. So if, you, if I've inspired any questions out there in our uh, viewing audience, please don't hesitate to uh, type in and ask your questions. And um, one of our moderators will chime in and read the question for us and then we can jump in and start answering. Um, you can see here, there's something kind of awkward about the way that this uh, description on this benchmark is. And there are plenty of ways to fix that. Um, one of the easy ways is to go up to our uh, gem. Um, and is that global edit mode or graphic edit mode? Global edit mode. Global, okay, good. So uh, when you're in global edit mode, that means you can grab any of these kind of um, mauve highlighted pieces of the schedule and move them around. And then they'll stay that way until you move them someplace else. And they move also with the uh, object they're connected with. So that can be very helpful for kind of a cleanup of, of the schedule. Dr. Vivek, have I uh, missed any important, uh, I guess I missed a few buttons here. Um, this is uh, really helpful, can be very helpful. It's an information object. So you can actually drop this any place on the canvas and link it to 
a document or a picture or a drawing, anything that you can get to, you can link to, and then you can bring it up right on the schedule. Um, so for instance, if you had a drawing of the site that you wanted to be able to refer to during the interactive planning session, uh, you can put it here and you can pop it right up while you're uh, discussing that part of the schedule. So uh, moderation, do we have any uh, questions out there yet? So quiet. Hi, Tim. Um, I'll start putting them in the chat here for you. Oh, great, thank you. So uh, first one is, what is the number of activities you can have in a NetPoint schedule? It's a great question. Um, I think uh, the most I've ever seen is about 1500, uh, but that's an extreme example. So I think uh, for comprehension and functionality, probably a few hundred is probably a good range. Dr. Vivek, do you have a, a different number? Yeah, I would say uh, that 300 to 500 would be the limit. Beyond that, NetPoint will allow you to draw them but or add them to your schedule, but yeah, it might start affecting some performance uh, measures right. for us. One of the ways that I've seen uh, more activities come in is uh, through a portfolio planning. In that case, uh, let's say that you have a hundred projects and each project has its own little band here. Um, and within the hundred projects, then you have 10 activities kind of out laying out like the big chunks of process you can get uh, I think part of what slows that point down when you have tons of activities is all the logical connections and the redrawing and recalculation. So um, sometimes if you have activities that, that are kind of stand alone in their own lane, uh, that point performs a little bit better even with more activities. Also, um, you can add resources to that point. And when you start adding a bunch of resources to a bunch of activities um, and you're trying to show the histogram recalculating in real time, I found that to be a little bit of a performance challenge sometimes. Okay, our next question. Can you show again how to format logic lines to avoid clashes? Oh, sure. Um, thanks for that. Uh, so within that point, if you double click on a, on a logic tie, it's gonna come up and show you the uh, link object properties. And within that, if you look at the geometry, then you can control um, with the shape that that line takes on the canvas. So for instance, um, let's do, uh, I don't know, Dr. Vivek, what's your preference here? Vertical, horizontal instead of horizontal, vertical? Yeah. Okay, VH, yeah. we'll go VH. Yeah. Here it goes. So then that changes the link line so it goes this way. Um, and basically in our scheme of things, we think it's best for lines to not uh, kind of go through other activities and block things out. So that's uh, that's kind of the idea behind uh, the ability to change the, the shape of the logic tie. That doesn't change the logic at all. So that, that'll always be the same. Okay, our next question. Do zoom and stretch have any impact on the printing size? That's a great question. Uh, in fact, they do not. Uh, so, a uh, best practice is to reset everything to 100 before you print so you can see what it's going to look like when you actually print it. Okay, and then can you show us a shortcut to find open ended activities in a larger schedule? Oh, geez. Boy, that's a toughie. I think so. All right. Um, that's why we have the Dr. Vivek on to help me out. But I think, I think you would go to, uh, what is it, edit? So, yeah. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll do a search and filter objects, <coughs> and uh, within that, we're going to look for activities and delays, and we're going to look for no successors. You you agree with me, Doctor Vivek, so far? Yeah, no successors and no predecessors, probably. Oh, if okay. You look at both ends. Okay, we'll go both, and we're going to click add that to the list. Well, apparently I'm such a good scheduler that I can't demonstrate that, but I can uh, I can go ahead and create that uh, here. Let's see. I'll just create a new activity out in here, out in space here, and we'll call it uh, T 
Tim's last activity. And then we're going to go back to edit, search and filter objects. And then we're going to say, look in activities for no successors and, or no predecessors. That's an or, right? Not an it's and. an and, actually. Oh. Yeah. oh yeah. Wow. So okay. that's why fencing didn't show up. So Yeah. OK. Yeah. I'm going to go no successors this time and okay. see what pops in there. OK, now we have fencing and Tim's last activity showing up in this list. That's helpful, but what would be more helpful is if in a big network, if we could highlight those. So the way you can do that is say, select them all and then highlight them. And when you do that, what NetPoint does is it fades everything else and just highlights those activities on the canvas so that they're uh, easy to find. Um, then you say to yourself, well, that's great, Tim, but how do I get my schedule back? Uh, and the answer to that is you go objects, restore faded colors for all objects, and then boom, you're back. Okay. okay. The next question is, can you insert uh, pictures or images onto the canvas to provide additional information to schedule consumers? Yeah, you sure can. Um, you can copy and paste any, uh, any image you want onto the screen. Um, I do not have an image handy. So let me just take a picture here. Uh, oh, it'd be helpful if I use my selector. Okay. I'm going to take a picture, a little snag from my screen. And then I'm going to paste that. Uh, I'm going to do a control V um, to paste that. And so now you have that picture on your canvas. And you can, you could use a logo if you wanted to brand it. Um, there's all kinds of uh, things. You know, this afternoon when we do our advanced training, we're going to talk about headers and footers a little bit. Um, that's a signal, Dr. Vivek. Um, we're going to talk about headers and footers a little bit. And so um, you have that uh, capability within that point. Any more questions? Yep. So uh, the next question is, what would you suggest is the ideal web and conference room setup to host interactive planning sessions? Or what's your experience with that? That's a great question. Um, so within uh, interactive planning session, you know, typically you, it's best to keep the audience maybe to 10 or 15 people um, if you can, because if you get more than that, then it's hard for them to actually see the image that you're projecting. So we suggest that you project the image um, as big as you can and as bright and clear. Um, so a high resolution, high uh, light cam or uh, projector is super helpful. Um, and the way that we usually do an interactive planning session, we, uh, we have one person who's the scribe and one person who's kind of the leader of the interactive planning session. So one person is driving that point and the other person is uh, leading the, the group in the discussion. And that way you, you, do, you keep the software kind of in the background. It doesn't become the central feature where somebody kind of delaying the conversation to be working on the schedule. Um, I had one uh, interactive planning session I did in Australia and um, we had 65 people in the room and the room was not really set up so that everybody could see the screen. And in that case, what I ended up doing is kind of what we're doing right here. I created a, a web meeting and everybody in the room could have the, the schedule right in their laptop. And we also projected it at the front. So the, the team that was actually working on their a uh, horizontal band, they'd come up front and work on it, but everybody else would be seated and they'd see their schedule right in front of them. Okay, another question. Is there a way to target a schedule to an earlier update? Oh, well, we we're going to cover that in advance, but I'll give you a little short demo here. Um, so yes, there is. Uh, this sounds like an ins inside ball question, but uh, this is our data date here. So if we drop a data date onto the schedule, uh, it's going to ask you, do you want to capture the baseline? And the right answer is almost always yes. Um, so now we have this data date showing, and I'm going to do an update to the schedule. So for instance, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, actualize this. 
I lost the word there for a second. So now that Tim's loss activity is actualized, um, that means that this blue line on the left of the data data is showing that this is set in concrete, you can't change it. You can still extend the duration a little bit if you need to, but you can't change it to the left of the day to day. And kind of the best practice is you go through and you make your adjustments um, to the schedule and whatever you need to do to update it to accurately reflect the, the actual progress. And then um, if you go to these little uh, spy glasses visual target mode, you'll be able to compare uh, your current with your last update. And now you can see on the schedule that we have a little shadow down here. So you've got yeah. the original schedule. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, you set the baseline to be the current state. Instead ah, of thank you, Dr. Vivek. All right. Um, so let's see, how do I get back there, Dr. Vivek? You need to go into uh, the tools. Menu. Oh, thank you. Okay. Targets manager? Yep. All right. So I got these backwards. That's a classic uh, mistake that uh, someone like me might make, uh, which is why it's always important to have Dr. Vivek in the room. Oh, shoot. There we go. All right. Is that, that better, Dr. Vivek? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So yeah, now we've got uh, the shadow on the left, which was the original baseline. And then you can see this was a pretty ca ca catastrophic uh, update where we are now um, much later, 23 days later, it shows us than uh, in our original baseline. So uh, that's the quick answer is yes, you can. And um, we're going to get into more detail on that uh, during our advanced training. Okay, one last question. Someone's asking about uh, changing the position of the dates on the schedule. Ah, okay. Let me uh, kind of clean this up. I'm going to turn off the, um, the shadow activities. And so let's say, for instance, uh, this is not looking too great right here uh, where the dates are. I'm assuming they mean the dates on the activities. Um, so you can do that with uh, just selecting the activity and dragging it over a little bit so that you don't have any clashes. Um, you can also, uh, within the properties for a given object, you can turn on or off dates so you can make that adjustment here. That's, uh, that's how you move dates around. So 50 minutes has flown by. Uh, I'm so glad you joined us for the conference and uh, for this first uh, session, the introduction to NetPoint.